The greatest probably is this. If you go to the Old Testament, Moses asked for the name of God. During the burning bush experience, when God called Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, Moses said, what is your name that I may take the people? And God says, I am that I am, Yahweh, his holy name. I've always been, I always will be. And so now enter Jesus onto the scene in John chapter 8. He walks up to the Jews of his day and he says, your father Abraham looked forward to my day. And they say, you're not even 50 years old and you claim to have seen Abraham? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, I am. Not I was, but I am. He took that holy name of God, Yahweh, I am, for himself. And the Bible says that the people in that day took up stones to kill him. So I say to you, it's very important for you to understand who Jesus claimed to be. He didn't claim to be just a mere prophet. He claimed to be God. And there's only two responses to that truth. You either hate him and you stone him, or you worship him. There's nothing in between. You can't just say, oh, I, I, I like some of his teachings. Oh, I think he's kind of a, he was a good teacher. No, you can't go in between. It's not what he claimed to be. He claimed to be one with God. So you either stone him like they wanted to do in John 8, and why they ultimately crucified him, or you do like John 20, what Thomas did when he put his finger in, in, in his hand after the resurrection where the, the, the nail was put in Jesus' hand and he put his hand in Jesus' side and he fell on his face. He fell on his face and he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus didn't say, whoa, wait a minute, Thomas. I'm just a prophet. You're getting a little carried away. No, Jesus said, blessed are you, Thomas, because you have seen and believed. But blessed are those who will not see and yet believe. And so look what Jesus says to Peter here. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus, Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I want you to know this. Some of you will never be able to get over that block. I, I wasn't able to because that's what I was taught as a Muslim. There's no way for God to become a human. You know what's so amazing is even Muslims believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, which by the way points to his deity because the prophet Isaiah in chapter 7 of Isaiah said, the virgin shall give birth and his name shall be Emmanuel, which means God with us, not prophet with us. He was born of a virgin. It points to his deity. He lived the sinless life I was taught as a Muslim. And do you know the Bible says there is none righteous, not even one, only God is sinless. So two truths that Muslims hold about Jesus which point to who he is. He is one with God. Jesus is God. Who do you say he is? Well, now listen. He's more than just God in human form. He came for a reason. Now jump to verse 21 or listen. Look what he says next to his disciples. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Well, in that one verse, you got the entire gospel, the entire good news. So who is Jesus? He's one with God. He's God who put on human flesh and came into this world. Why did he come? So we got who, now we get the why. He came, eyes up here, I don't want you to miss it. He came to suffer, die, and rise again. That's why he came. He didn't come just to, again, teach new truths or just to heal people or just to perform miracles. He ultimately came to go to the cross and die a death in our place. He is not only God, but He is Savior, the only Savior of mankind. And all of the Bible points forward to this truth. When Adam and Eve first sinned in the garden, God moves in and He performs a sacrifice. He takes the skin of the animal sacrifice and the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, without a sacrifice, there cannot be remission of sin. There cannot be removal of sin. The Bible says, Adam and Eve sinned, and therefore that disease has spread to all mankind, that we are sinners at birth, separated from God. But God provided our hope right there in the garden. He performs this sacrifice. He takes the animal uh, skin of the animal, and he, put, he clothes the nakedness and the shame of Adam and Eve. It's a picture of Christ who would be the sacrifice to cover over our shame and our nakedness before a holy God. He drove Adam and Eve out of the garden 
And at the garden, at the edge of the garden, he put a, a, an angel and a flaming sword as if to say for mankind to come back into the presence of God, someone must fall under the sword. There must be a sacrifice to be paid for sins. And all of the Bible pointed forward to that. And so Abraham took his son to the altar and he laid him down as God commanded him to. And as he's about to sacrifice his son, God provides a substitutionary sacrifice in the form of a ram whose horns were caught in the thicket. And God stopped him and he puts this substitutionary sacrifice in the place of his son and his son is is returned to the Father. And so we, we are returned to the Father. We come back into the presence of God because God provided a sacrifice, a substitutionary sacrifice. That's a picture of Jesus. Moses, when God called Moses to take the Passover lamb and to sacrifice it and take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost and everywhere the angel of death there in Egypt during the plagues, everywhere the angel of death, he passed over and he saw the blood, he would pass over and not strike down the firstborn son. That's a picture of Jesus. That he would be the Lamb of God, as John the Baptist says, who takes away the sins of the world and he shed his blood on the cross. Listen to me, that when you and I die and we meet our maker and because we're sinners, we must be punished for sin. The Bible says if you put your faith in Christ, it's like that blood on the doorpost and God will pass over the judgment you deserve because Jesus paid it for you on the cross. All of the Bible points to this. Even his name declares who he is and why he came. Do you know the name Jesus literally means Jehovah saves. He is the God who saves. And when his name was given, the angel told Joseph, you shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So that's who he is. Yeah, that's repulsive to prideful man. I don't need a savior. That was the very first sin in the garden. The enemy came to Adam and Eve and said, man, you don't need God. God said, if you eat from that tree, you're going to die. No, no, no. God knows. He's just saying that. He knows if you eat from that tree, that you'll become like him, knowing good and evil. And the pride of man is, I don't need God. I can do it myself. And that's what religion is, basically. I can do good works on my own to attain heaven on my own. And so Adam and Eve turned and they ate from the tree and they themselves turn from God and that's where man went from being God-centered to, to being self-centered and that's when sin entered the world and the judgment that God pronounced if you eat from the tree you'll die therefore we all face death both physically and spiritually every one of us are dead before Jesus makes us alive all of the Bible points forward to our need of a Savior so he's God he's Savior and so if that's true I say to you again, if this is true, I'm telling you, either you think he's a lunatic, crazy, deceiver, and you throw stones at, at him. You, you, you want to just re re repel him, or you bow your knee and worship him as your Lord. And so look what happens next. Because by the way, before I read the next part, I have some of my good Muslim friends say to me that Christianity makes no sense. Jesus paid it all, so you just kind of believe in Jesus and you're fine. And they think that the commitment, the call of Christ, is just, hey, believe the right things and go your way. Go do whatever you want. That's not the call of Christ. Look what it says next. Look at verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So everyone look here real quickly. The call of Christ on your life is not just believe the right things about me. Who do you say I am? Meaning, if you truly believe that he is the God who saves, then you will not just believe merely mental assent to who he is, but you will believe in the sense of following him. Denying yourself and taking up your cross. He said, I'm going to go to, to Jerusalem, suffer, die, and rise again. And by the way, if you're going to be a true follower, you're going to take up your cross. Now, every one of those disciples knew that the cross was the form of execution of the day. All right? So let's not beat around the bush. Jesus is saying, you got to lay your life down to follow me. He says it over and over again. People don't want to talk about this part. 
But Jesus constantly, he went to James and John in the boat with their father, and he said, come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. The Bible says immediately they dropped their nets, and they left their father, and they followed him. So for people to follow Jesus, they had to lose family. Jesus went to Matthew, the tax collector, and he said, follow me. And the Bible says immediately he got up and he followed him. People left family, people left business behind, people left standing behind to follow him. And there's a cost to following him. And people don't want to talk about that. Don't misunderstand me. There's, you, you can't earn salvation. Jesus paid it all. But what I'm trying to say to you, it's not just easy believism. It's a commitment of your life to lay it down to follow him. One more verse. In Luke 14, Jesus says this, this way. Yeah, the Bible says Jesus is walking and there's a mass of people following behind him. And he turns to them and he performs something like what I would call is like a weed out course in college. Okay? You know what I'm talking about. So I was here at the University of Texas and I was pre-med until I got to organic chemistry. Okay? But let me just say, I was pre-med until God called me to do something else. But I was pre-med and that first semester biology and painter, that first semester chemistry and Welch, you know, uh, those were, are those still around? I think they are, right? Painter and Welch? They didn't rename those, did they? No. Are those like, like you walk in and you get like a Starbucks smoothie just like pops in your hand or something like that? I don't know. Everything's so nice now. It's amazing. All right, so that first semester chemistry, biology, stay with me now. They make it so stinking hard, right? Why? Because they want to know, do you have what it takes to go all the way to the end and get your degree? Because if you're going to flunk out, you might as well flunk out. This is the concept of a weed out course. You might as well flunk out in the first semester, right? And save their time and save your parents money. It's a great concept, okay? They're weeding out the duds. Well, you think, we think Jesus just wanted to lower the bar and say, hey, just believe the right thing. That's not what you find in the scripture. Jesus, everyone's following him. He's healing people. And check this out. He turns around and check out this weed out course. He says, if you're going to come my way, you must hate your father, mother, wife, and children, and even your own life to be my disciple. You must forsake all that you have in order to be my disciple. That's pretty strong language. Hate your father, mother. Does God hate the family and want to tear up the family? No. God loves the family. He created the family. But here's what it means. That even that precious relationship of a family should not come between you and following Jesus. And even that relationship would be like hate to you compared to your love and your commitment to following him regardless of the cost. He goes on to say, if anyone wants to build a tower, he must first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. So I say to you, do you truly follow Jesus? Now you might say to me, where's the good news there? Where's the, you said gospel's good news. I got to die to get this Jesus? I got to lay my life down? Where's the good news? Well, the good news is the very next verse in Matthew 16 and verse 25. It says this, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So look at me real quick before I share my story. Some of you guys, you might be that you believe the right things, but you're saying, man, you're holding on to your life. You're, you still want to be king of your life. You're saying, no, I know if I'd really trust this Jesus, I may have to lose this thing. Look, and you're holding on. And Jesus is saying, if you try to save your life, you're actually losing it. But if you would lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. And I would say it may not be the life you have for yourself, but it's the life you want, college student. And I didn't understand this call to follow Jesus when I first became a Christian. Let me share my story, and then I'll pray and we'll be done. I was born in Houston, Texas. When I was two years old, my family moved back to Iran. Anybody? Farsi Baradi? Edish Mama Borak. We're just going to have a little conversation here. As in, we're wishing each other Happy New Year because Iranian New Year was a couple of days ago. But, anyways, all right, let's move on. Um, well, I just got a big reaction from Houston. I just wanted to see if there's anyone from Iran. And right here. All right, here we go. All right, so when I was two years old, my family moved back to Iran. When I was six years old, the Islamic Revolution hit that country. That's before your time, I'm sure. Uh, it was in the late 70s. I was there. I was six years old. 
fa fighting broke out. I remember Muslim revolutionaries on our rooftop shouting Allah Akbar, which means to Allah be the glory, as they were starting the revolution against the king, the Shah of Iran. Well, my father being a doctor had the means to get us out. And so he got us out 10 days before the Shah escaped, we got out of Iran, moved back to Houston when I was in the middle of first grade. Remember I left when I was two years old? Now I'm six years old when I came back to Houston. So I didn't speak English, I spoke Farsi, which is the language of Iran, which is what I just spoke with my sister right here, right? And uh, Farsi was my first language, I didn't speak English, so God in his incredible plan provided for me a Christian lady who had become my tutor. And this lady would teach me the English language every day after school by reading me books. In the second grade she came up to me and she said, Afshin, you've been reading all these books, now I want to hand you the most important book you'll ever get in your life. And she handed me a small New Testament. And she said, you're not going to understand this book, but promise me you'll hold on to it and read it later in your life. She plants a seed in my life in the second grade, guys, that wouldn't come to fruition until 10 years later. And by the way, she gave me that Bible during the Iran hostage crisis, again, before your time. But the American embassy in Tehran in Iran was taken over by Muslim radicals, and a group of Americans were held hostage for over a year. It was not easy to be from Iran and living in this country. In Houston, Texas, as a second crater, I had rocks thrown through our window in Houston. My parents' cars, tires were slashed. Older high school kids threatened to beat up my brother and I. And I share this not to throw a pity party, but just to say, had any other American given me a Bible, a New Testament, I would have probably thrown it away. You want to win a Muslim for Christ or you want to influence anyone for Christ? I believe you got to earn the right to be heard, Christians. And she did it by the way she loved me and she taught me English and she poured herself into me and she handed me the Bible. And since it came from her, I said, this must be important. As a second grader, didn't understand everything. I just took it home and threw it in my house. Grew up a Muslim. And not just any Muslim. My dad was the president of the Islamic Medical Society in Houston. Okay. So all I ever was taught was the five pillars of faith of Islam, that Jesus was just a prophet again. And so my senior year in high school, I'm playing basketball. I take the Lord's name in vain, like many of us do. I said, Jesus. And the guy walks up to me and says, hey, that Jesus you just said, he's my God. <laughs> no, he's not. He, he's your prophet. No, 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 he's, he's my God. I go, no, you're crazy. He's just a prophet. And so I thought the guy was nuts. I went home and turned on the TV, and it wasn't even a Christian show. It was a historical documentary about Jesus, one of those shows. And at the end of it, it said, now some worship him as God, and they're called Christians. And I went, wait a minute. That's what that guy just said, you know? <laughs> and right then, God put that Bible on my mind. I said, you know, I think I got a Bible somewhere. So I went up to my room, looked all over it. And if you can believe this, after 10 years, I found that small New Testament sitting at the bottom of my closet waiting for me all those years. So I opened it up. The first book of the New Testament is Matthew. Starts off a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. And I knew Abraham being a Muslim. So that kind of drew me in. And I read the whole book of Matthew in one sitting. Now, I didn't understand it all, but God just developed a hunger in my heart to keep reading. Every day, under the covers, with a flashlight, I'd keep reading and keep reading and hide my reading from my family. Until one day I got to the book of Romans. Changed my life. In the book of Romans, I read about a righteousness, or if you will, a right standing with God. That comes apart from the law, meaning apart from what I do for God. And it said that this righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ, meaning what he did for me. Faith in him to all who believe. And that was big for me. Because I thought I was born a Muslim, I was stamped a Muslim, I'd always be a Muslim. But that's it for any race, any ethnicity, anyone who believes. So two weeks after that, I'm sitting at a football practice in Houston at Stratford High School. The guy came up and he invited me to... Uh, a, a Christian event with a very funny name, a uh, very peculiar name for me, being a Muslim at the time. If you've studied your history, any, you know why this is weird for me. Uh, so he comes up to me, this Christian dude, hey, Afshin, you want to come to this crusade with me? And I'm like, <laughs> I said, hey, bro, I'm a Muslim. You're inviting me to a thing called crusade? And he goes, oh, no, 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 it has nothing to do with that. He goes, there's free pizza there. I go, oh, okay, I like crusade. So, so, so I went to this crusade, and I went um, for free pizza. And I heard the gospel, and I heard what Jesus did for me. And something touched my heart. 
And some of you listen to me, you're, you're already saying, Afshin, I think what you're saying is ridiculous. But I just want you to know, as Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. My prayer is this, that for you, you may be saying this is ridiculous, but it's going to take for anyone to believe in Jesus. The Father in heaven must open your eyes to understand who he is. And that's our prayer, that that, that happens for you this week. And so I, it happened for me. My eyes opened, and I went forward. I don't even know what I was doing. I just looked at the guy, and he goes, Do you need Jesus? And I said, Yes, sir. And that day I prayed and gave my life to Christ, the best day of my life. But what I want to share with you is what happened after I became a Christian. Because again, I didn't understand the call. Follow me. Take up your cross. So I'm driving home from this crusade, and then it hits me. What am I going to tell my dad? What am I going to tell my family? And I don't know about you, but my father has always been my hero. I've always wanted to be a dad like him. I've always looked up to him. And so... I'm, nobody sat me down at that crusade and said, oh, by the way, Afshin, when you get home, your dad will still be a Muslim. Good luck. <laughs> nobody sat me down and said, oh, by the way, you ought to know there's a cost to following Christ. And that's why I want to be so careful that you understand the call. So I'm driving home and I'm like, what am I going to do? And I'm ashamed to tell you this, but for about a year and a half, I hid my faith from my dad. I would hide, you used to have to get dressed up for church. I don't know if you remember those days, but I would hide my nice clothes in my car on Saturday night and go change at a restaurant on Sunday morning before I went to church. So my parents wouldn't figure out where I was going. I'd intercept mail from the church I was attending. I hide all, all this stuff. Finally, one day my dad found out. He sat me down. He said, what's going on? Said, dad, what do you mean? He said, there's something different about you. And I said, well, dad, I'm a Christian. And he said, excuse me? I said, I'm a Christian. He said, no, you're not, young man. You're a Muslim and you'll always be a Muslim. I said, Dad, the Bible says if I trust in Christ alone for my salvation, then I'm a Christian and I do. And my dad said, Afshin, if you're going to be a Christian, then you can no longer be my son. And that's when it first nailed me, man. Here's a God I've known for a year and a half. Here's my dad, my entire upbringing, my hero. And I want you to know everything in me, my flesh wanted to say, forget it. I'll be a Muslim. And I share that so you know I'm not boasting today because even I was surprised when instead my mouth opened and these words came out. I said, Dad, if I have to choose between you and Jesus, then I choose Jesus. And if I have to choose between my earthly father and my heavenly father, then I choose my heavenly father. And my dad said, then you're no longer my son. Get your stuff and get out of here. He disowned me on the spot. I walk upstairs to my room. I fell on my face and I said, God, how could you do this to me? I said, Jesus, if you're real, how could you take my dad away from me? And I dare you, by the way, to speak that honestly with God, because he'll speak back. And he did. I didn't hear him audibly, but in my heart, he said, open the word. And guys, I want you to know, I turn in the scriptures to Matthew 10, and I won't even turn there right now. I just want you to hear it. You can look it up later. Listen to what Jesus, I read in Matthew 10, what Jesus said, right after my dad disowned me, Jesus says, Whoever acknowledges me, acknowledges me before my father, excuse me, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before my father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him. Remember, who do you say I am? Then it goes on, and this is where it really gets crazy. Remember again, right after my dad disowned me, I'm reading this. Jesus says, do not suppose I came to bring peace to the earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And then he says, for I have come to turn a man against his father. And I'm like, Whoa. <laughs> Missed that the first time I read that. It just happened for me. A daughter against her mother. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And then again, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And that's when I first understood what it means to really believe and follow him regardless of the cost. See, for me, my dad was still number one in my life. For you, it may be something else. And I'm just saying to you, do you just believe the right things or do you follow him? Jesus says, my sheep, they know me, they follow my voice, and they don't follow a strange voice. And that day, I'm not perfect. I, 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 just like Paul said, I die daily. I have to die daily. But that day, I got on my face. I said, Jesus, I trust you. I'll follow you. And look how faithful God was. I came here to the University of Texas way back in 19 <clears throat> something, all right? And I went potluck, which you know what that means. I 
submitted my form to Doby Dormitory to live there. And I went potluck, which means they just slap you with somebody for a year. Now, my name is Afshin Ziafat. So you're probably going to get stuck with someone that's got a name kind of like that. It's not that crazy, maybe you'd say, but listen to this. 50-something thousand students, I don't know how many are here, going potluck, and I prayed, God, give me a Christian roommate. Never lived with a Christian in my life. Was going through this stuff with my dad and said, God, get, give me a Christian roommate. Look at this. I get here, potluck, show up, my roommate, Fareed Tolba. Ready for this? A Christian from a Muslim background, all right, who had just accepted Christ, who was hiding his faith from his dad, whose dad was also a prominent Muslim in Houston. You're not impressed yet? Okay, we both had, we both had six letters in our first and last name, all right? We both had the same Bible when we met each other, and you're not going to believe this. God is my witness. We both dated the same girl in high school and didn't know each other. Didn't know each other. Now, we didn't date her at the same time. That'd be freaky, all right? So, I don't know. I guess she likes olive skin or something. I don't know. But I dated her in my uh, youth group that I was going to my senior year, and he dated her in his high school. And I'm not making this up. The day we met each other, 14th floor, they're in Dobie Dormitory. The day we met each other, we both had her same senior picture in our wallets, all right? Now, you tell me. That's not God, all right? So, so God used... God used Freed and I to lean on each other. Let me say, okay, I got a little bit more time. Let me just finish up my story and get to the close here. Are you still with me, yeah? All right. So, my relationship with my dad was restored, kind of, a year later. Because my dad thought my Christianity was just a phase. And so his deal was now, okay, as long as you go be a doctor and make me proud. And this was the plan. I was going to graduate UT and go uh, into medical school and take over his practice. He's gonna pay for the whole thing. He's gonna take over his practice and be set for life. But God had another plan for my life. I was involved in a Christian fraternity here, yep. and we started, uh, and, and I started sharing my testimony. I started speaking. I'd walk underneath that tower where it says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And I'd use that inscription. Uh, like Paul did in Acts 17 and tell people about Jesus and man God just started developing this hunger in my heart for evangelism and every one of my friends knew it and so they said man you're gonna you're called to preach about Jesus I said no way am I going to my dad who sort of accepted that I'm a Christian and tell him that news no way and so my older sister becomes a Christian both of us separately and she writes me a letter and she said Afshin you're running from God's will and she said, I've seen a Christian out of God's will is like a fish out of water. He will struggle until he's put back in the water. And I was struggling. And she quoted 1 John 2, 17, which says, The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So the hardest thing I had to do was take my dad to lunch. My hand was shaking the whole time as I told him I'm not going to medical school. I'm going to seminary. And he said, what's seminary? I said, it's where you go and you learn how to preach about Jesus. And he called it the biggest stain on his life. He said, it is as if you have died in my heart. I said, Dad, you know how much I love you, how much I want you to be proud of me? He says, son, not only will I never be proud of you, but I'll always be ashamed of you as long as I live. Those are the hardest words for a man to hear from his father. But I went to Dallas-Fort Worth to go to seminary with $4 in my pocket, didn't have a job, only had my first semester's tuition paid for by my church to go to seminary, and look how faithful God was. God gave me a free place to live through a friend that found out about my situation, a rundown youth house that they fixed up, let me live there for free for four years. Somebody in Dallas found out about me, paid for my entire seminary degree. This church in Dallas finds out about me, asked me to come and be the pastor's assistant. I start preaching in that church and then around Dallas and then around Texas. And for 15 years, God gave me a nationwide speaking ministry, traveling all over the country until now. I'm a pastor in Frisco, by the way, but traveling all over preaching. My story has been put in magazines that have gone and reached Muslims who've come to Christ. Why? Because I'm an amazing speaker or because I got a good resume? No, man, because God had a plan for my life and he's got a plan for your life. And he's saying, and I'm, I'm, my fear is some of you are going to be so white knuckle grip holding on to your life that you're going to miss what God wants to do. You know what's so cool is that my relationship with my dad has been restored. He's not a Christian. We're still praying for that. But this past summer, I preached at First Baptist Houston in, in uh, Houston this July. And my father, who is 
never heard me preach in 15 years. He stepped into those doors and sat down in First Baptist Houston and heard me preach the gospel for the first time ever. Okay? So, God is faithful. And you know what? Let me say one more thing. i got to get to a close. There's a ministry in England. Check this out. There's a ministry in England called Elam Ministries that reaches into Iran through the underground church. Iran is closed to Christianity. It's hostile to, to the gospel, as you know. You know. They go, wait a minute. You're Iranian-American. You travel the country, preach. You know Farsi and English. You have your masters. And they go, you're the guy we're looking for. And I'm like, for what? <laughs> And no joke, he says, you know how we're going to overthrow the Islamic government in Iran? I'm like, uh, I don't know. And I remember at the time saying, Jack Bauer? I don't know, you know? So, and he said, by evangelizing the country one by one, will you help us? Now, guys, I can't get into Iran. My story's all over the internet. But there's a neighboring country where they have an underground training site where Iranian men and women who've come to faith in Christ through the underground church are sent to this country, sent to this training site. And I am one of about 10 teachers from around the world that I go there twice a year in my native language of Farsi and teach these men how to preach and how to do evangelism. And they go back into Iran and plant underground churches today. Now listen to me. Today, I could be a doctor and have my dad proud of me but I would have missed the life Christ had for me. And I'm just telling you, man, he says, if you would be willing to lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. And what's so amazing is there's men and women today that I've had the chance to, to, to train up that today are in prison in Iran. Farshid, who has started 20 house churches in Tehran, three years ago was arrested and has been, in, has, has been in prison since that day. The day after Christmas has not seen his family, his two kids for three years. Before he went to prison, he called the ministry I work with. He was on his way home. He knew the authorities were there with his wife. And he said, pray for me. Tell my brothers in the West, my brothers and sisters in the West, to pray not just that I would be released, but that I would suffer well, and that through my chains, my countrymen would know about Jesus. And I'm just wondering, how can that be what it looks like to follow Jesus over there? And what are we doing here? Do you follow him? regardless of the cost. And so what about you? Who do you say Jesus is? Do you say he's just a prophet? Do you make him out to be something you want him to be? And you can say that I think this thing is made up, but you better go and examine. There's, there is incredible reliability. I wish I had time to go into that behind this scripture. But you go and see what does Jesus say about himself? When Thomas worshipped him as God, he said, Blessed are you, but blessed are those who have not seen me, flesh and blood, and yet will believe. And I pray you believe in who he is. The Bible says we are separated, we are dead in our sins, there's nothing we can do to reach God. Every religion is man's attempt to get to God, but only in Christianity do you have God coming to mankind in the form of Jesus Christ. That's why he came. He entered our broken world. He lived a sinless life. He did that which you could never do. He died on the cross and shed his blood that if you receive him, you will stand righteous before a holy God, not because of what you have done, but because of what Christ did in your place. And so I say, will you put your faith in this Jesus? Will you trust him? And if you think, oh, that's just easy, believe in what he did for me, he did all the work. No, 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 I think I've made it clear. It's not just a mental ascent, oh, I believe the right things, check, I'll go do whatever I want. No, if you really believe this, you fall to your feet, I mean, to your, excuse me, face, and you say, God, I am yours, my life is yours, and I'll follow you regardless of the cost. So would you bow your head with me now? Would you close your eyes all over this place? And don't check out, don't tune out on me just yet. I'd love to lead you in a prayer right where you are. I'd love to pray over you. 